Okay, great. So, uh, let's see. Right. So I imagine quite a few of you have run into this sort of a problem. You write a grammar for your incredibly new, awesome programming language, and when you throw it at Yak, Yak gives you all sorts of errors. Now, there can be a number of reasons that this comes about. It might be you've written a grammar that is not LR, and so Yak can't handle it, even though uh, it should be expressible in the context-free grammar. But even if you're dealing with a, a general system, another thing that can happen is that there's an ambiguity inherent in uh, the language you've given. And it's this latter case that I want to talk to you about today. Now, there are a few different ways to solve uh, this problem. You can add maybe an associativity or precedence, and if you are, you're lucky. Uh, or you might have to rely on the fact that Yak prefers shifts over reduces. Or maybe you have to rewrite your entire grammar in order to get rid of the ambiguity. Well, I'm here to tell you today that there's a better way. We can use tree automata to solve exactly these sort of situations. Now, before we get into that, uh, I want to tell you, I, I want to go over some examples of the sorts of problems that we'll see. And in order to do that, I'm going to tell you the story of Todd. Now, Todd is an average programmer. He does web development during the day, and he likes to hack on projects during the evenings. And he gets the idea that he wants to write his own language in order to make web de development easier. So he goes online, and he learns about context-free grammars, and he finds a tutorial on using Yak. And he starts out fairly simply. He, he writes an expression-oriented uh, grammar for arithmetic. He throws it at Yak. He gets these weird errors. Fortunately, uh, the tutorial has already anticipated this and tells him that these sorts of errors are due to needing to declare the associativity or precedence of your operators. So for plus, we have to decide which of the pluses gets the root, or in precedence, whether plus or times gets them. And in, by adding associativity or precedence declarations, we can tell the parser that one of these two trees is not what we want. We want to reject that. Now, Todd kind of likes this, because he can write his grammar, and then he can come back and add these little annotations. And even better, he gets full control and choice over what he does. If he just changes the annotations from left to right, or the order of precedence, he can choose which of these trees he's going to get rid of. Well, he keeps on developing. He's making progress. He now has statements in addition to expressions, and if goes along easily. But then he goes to add a word. He gets more problems. And this time, the tutorial didn't mention anything about this, so he calls up his friend Alice. Now, Alice, she's not really a parsing expert, but she has some familiarity with this area. She's worked with the act once or twice. And she explains to him, oh, this is known as the dangling else problem. And it basically boils down to, should that else belong as part of the first if or as part of the second if? If it should belong as part of the first if, we want this tree on the left, whereas if it should be part of the second if, we want the tree on the right. She then go on, goes on to explain that Yak always prefers shifts over reduces, so in effect it will, there we go, always preserves shifts over reduces, so in effect it will always reject the left-hand tree. Now, Todd doesn't know what shifts and reduces are. His eyes kind of glaze over at that point. But he asks her, okay, but what if I wanted to reject the right-hand tree instead of the left-hand tree? Alice hems and haws a little bit and says something about, well, Yak does, you can't tell Yak for a reduce and over a shift, and basically tells him, no, you can't do that. Uh, and this makes Todd kind of sad, because with associativity precedence, he got to decide how his language was defined. But now his tool is dictating to him how the language of his, how the design of his language ought to be. Well, turns out associativity, uh, sorry, one-armed if was too much trouble. So he gets rid of that. But he goes around and reads about other programming languages. And he learns about uh, Haskell and ML. And in those languages, if isn't a statement. Instead, it's an expression. And he thinks this is actually a really cool idea. And he wants his programming language to be cool. So he decides he's going to add that to his language. You can guess what happens next. The difference this time, though, is he's getting a whole pile of uh, shifts and reduce conflicts. So he calls up Alice again. She says, oh, this is known as the ML if problem. Todd is starting to wonder how long the list of these 
this is known as that problem he's going to have to learn. Um, and she says, well, it basically comes down to uh, this. Should that plus four, should that be inside of the else clause of the if, or should it be outside uh, of it entirely? And if you want it to be outside, you need to choose the tree on the left. If you want it to be inside, you need to choose the tree on the right. And she again goes on to explain that because Yak does its shift and reduce, it's always going to reject the one on the left. Um, that's perfect. There we go. Uh, he, it's always going to reject on the left, but he's not really satisfied with that and asks if there's another way. And she points to him to a couple of articles about, you know, you can use some advanced features of these fancy programming systems, sorry, these fancy grammatical systems, but he wants to use Yak. He doesn't want to have to hold, learn a whole new system. And at that point, he basically, well, there's no good answer for him. Uh, so he decides, okay, having it be an expression would have been really cool. Maybe he'll just have to live with this language being just a little bit less cool. Right, so at this point, Todd's starting to actually make some progress and uh, a little bit more experience at all of this. He's successfully added function calls as well as field accesses. Then he goes to add uh, object allocation. Now, he wants his language to be a prototype-based language. So that means uh, when allocating an object, we're passing in an expression that is the prototype for the object we're going to be constructing. When he does this, he gets some shift-reduce conflicts. Calls up Alice again, but this time he has learned. So he's already figured out uh, what example string could cause this problem. And basically here, the question is, does the object allocation, the new expression, is that using the first set of parentheses or the second set of parentheses? If it's using the second set of parentheses, then f.g is a prototype of the object allocation, and we get the tree on the left. If it's using the first set of parentheses, .g is a function called on the result of object allocation, and we get the tree on the right. Now at this point, Alice chains up, wait a minute, JavaScript, they, they have operators like this, why don't we go see how they do it? So they dig up their copy of uh, the JavaScript standard, and they're met with these functions, which they then spend about half an hour puzzling over and trying to figure out what these are doing. They diagram the relations between the non-terminals. It's a little bit more complicated here because JavaScript has both uh, new expressions with parentheses and new expressions that have no parentheses whatsoever. Um, but at this point, Todd's kind of gotten fed up. It's been four days of constant issues, and oh, you have to do those, uh, precedence, but that doesn't work for this one, so you have to do shift reduce, which dictates your language to you, or you can rewrite your grammar into something that is a little bit less easy to understand and maintain. So he decides, okay, you know what? Maybe writing programming languages isn't for him. He'll just go program in JavaScript. Now, this is a little bit of a sad story. Let's take a look at each of these and see if there's another way that we could do better. So in each of these examples, we've got some string. And that string can parse to two different trees. And in each case, we want to reject one of those two trees. Now, if we look at that tree we want to reject, we'll notice that each of them actually falls into a pattern. So on the top, we've got one constructor under another, and but we don't care about what's below or what's above. In the bottom, it actually gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, starting from the right with the new expression, Underneath the new, you want to go down the left-hand path as many times as necessary, and then check to see if you see a call there. Excuse me. Uh, then in the lower left, uh, this one actually gets a little complicated. We want to start as a plus, and then we want to look in the left-hand child of the plus. And from there, we want to go down zero or more times along the rightward descending path, and if we ever find an if along that path, we need to reject the tree. Now, if we had a formalism that allowed us to express these and manipulate them, 
we might be able to make strides towards a way to rewrite grammars automatically in order to exclude these types of trees. Now, it turns out such formalism already exists. They're known as tree automata. And tree automata are really cool, and they've been getting a lot of attention, but they're not necessarily as well known as their cousin string automata. And if you're interested in tree automata, I would definitely recommend reading this book. Uh, it was and it gives you a very good overview of what tree automata are and how you can manipulate them. But I'm going to give you a quick crash course uh, on what tree automata are for any that might not be familiar. Tree automata can be defined in terms of a set of productions, sort of like a context-free grammar, except that instead of, not instead of, in addition, we're going to label every production with a tree label constraint. Now, for presentation, I'm now going to erase all of the terminals. This doesn't affect the math. It just lets me fit everything on one slide. Uh, and now the last production there, that's epsilon, meaning we have nothing on the right-hand side of that production. So now we've got a tree automata. How are we going to recognize against the tree? Well, we can try to generate trees that would be matched by this tree automaton by starting in some start state. Here, we're going to use expressions. And then we interpret each production as a tree rewrite rule. So we can interpret the first rule as saying, OK, I can go from an expression to a tree fragment rooted with plus, because that's the uh, label on the production, that has two children that are both expressions, because that's what's on the right-hand side of the production. So if I do that rewrite, I'm this tree. I can apply the rewrite again to the left-hand tree. I can use the second rule in order to rewrite the right-hand expression. And then to finish things off, I'm just going to use the uh, last one, uh, the integer case, which the integer has nothing on its right-hand side, so these will not have any children. Now that I've gotten rid of all of the non-terminals in this tree, uh, I know that I have, I lost my, Now that I've gotten rid of all of the non-terminals in this tree, uh, I know I have a tree that would be accepted by this tree automaton. Now, the process, as I've described, is in terms of generation. There are other algorithms for uh, recognition. I'm just skipping over those for now. Now, there's another way that you can look at tree automata, and that is in terms of regular expressions. But whereas normal regular expressions uh, would be looking at the fringe of this tree and just horizontally checking to see if the string we're matching is what we want, for tree automata, our regular expressions are going to be looking down the paths from the root to each, uh, to each leaf. And they're going to check as they go along what constructors we're going to see and specify which ones we're allowed to see. And so a tree will be accepted if and only if every path down that tree is accepted by regular expression. So for example, we could say plus. We're allowed to see one of those. And a plus is going to have children. Now what this box represents is continue matching at whatever the next sequencing or cleaning star in this regular expression is. So we'll come back to that. We can also see a star. And finally, we can see integers. Integers have no children, so there's nothing in those parentheses. Now, we want to be able to see, once we've seen a plus or a star, we want to restart matching the entire thing again, so we match the whole thing inside of a cleaning star. Now, the cool thing about tree automata, unlike context-free grammars, is that they can be intersected and negated. They're closed and computable. This means that at a high level, we can take our context-free grammar, apply labelings to each of the productions, write a set of tree automata that we will accept any tree except the ones we want to reject, intersect those into uh, the intersect those into the tree automata that came from the grammar. That gives us a new tree automata with that restriction. We then just erase the labels, and we get back a CFG that has been restricted and avoids uh, those undesired grammars. So now, if we go back to our examples, let's see what happens. So for associativity, we want to look for a plus that's in the right-hand side of another plus. The underscores here are wildcard. Say we don't care what's underneath here. Now, for this, we want to look not just at the root, but anywhere within the tree. So we're going to prefix this with, there we go. Uh, we're going to prefix this with the any wildcard. 
and the any wildcard steps down one layer to any child of the current node. We wrap that with a cleaning star, which means we're searching the entire tree. Now this is a tree we want to reject, so finally we apply negation to the entire thing. And if we do this for associativity of plus and times and precedence, and then apply a little bit of magic, algorithmic magic we described in the paper, we get back a grammar that looks like this, which is exactly how the grammar by hand if you are manually encoding precedence and associativity. The difference here is you've been able to leave your grammar in the natural simple way to write it, and then you can modularly compose in uh, various restrictions that you want to apply. Same situation shows up for uh, one armed if. We just want to check to see if a one armed if is inside of a two armed if. But the important difference here is now we actually have a choice. Because if we want to choose the other tree, we can just restrict seeing a two-arm diff inside of a one-arm diff. Uh, now moving on to ML if. This one gets a little interesting because it's actually a deep pattern match that we want to do. So what we're going to do there we go. Uh, what to do is uh, starting at the plus operator. We don't care what's in the right-hand side, so that's just the underscore wildcard. But we look in the left -hand side, so that's why we have the box there. Then we're going to use this right wildcard, and the right wildcard is like the any wildcard, except instead of going to any children, it only goes to the rightmost child. Finally, uh, we wrap that in a cleany star, and then just check to see if we see an if along that path. Uh, the story for JavaScript's new is very similar. The only difference here is that because of the structure of the JavaScript grammar, the only constructors we care about along that path are actually uh, field access and array access. So, to summarize, we have a set of patterns that we want to reject. We can describe these patterns in terms of tree automata regular expression, or there's many different ways to express tree automata. I've only shown you one here. Then at a high level, we can take our context-free grammar, apply labelings to each of the productions, add in various tree automata that specify our restrictions, intersect them in, erase, and we get a context-free grammar at the end. Now there's a few things I have not covered that are in the paper. Uh, we do some case studies on both C and JavaScript. We have some performance benchmarks. Uh, we show uh, well-behavedness properties with respect to LR grammars, and there's a little bit of algorithmic magic you have to do to make sure these intersections don't take forever, but we describe So please take a look at the paper, and I would be happy to talk to people about this or tree automata in general. I think they're actually a really, really cool data structure. And the next time you're working with the part Maybe think about writing a preprocessor that does this. Because keep in mind, this is a transformation from context-free grammar to context-free grammar. So at the end, you can still be using Yak or Java CC or Antler or whatever you want. And now I would be happy to take any questions.